The Borrowers Aloft, Chapter 24 Later that night, when, having eaten and cleared away, the four of them sat around the fire, Arietti began to feel a little annoyed with Spiller. Balloon crazy, that's what he seemed to have become, and all within a few short hours. No eyes, no ears, nor thoughts for anyone or anything except for those boring shreds of shriveled rubber now safely stored with the other trappings in the back of the village shop. He had listened, of course, at supper when Arietti, hoping to interest him, had tried to recount their adventures. But if she paused even for a moment, the bright, dark glance would fly again to Pod. And again, in his tense, dry way, he would ply Pod with questions. Oiled silk instead of rubber next time for the canopy. The silk would be easy to borrow, and Mr. Pot would have the oil. Questions on wind velocity, trail ropes, moorings, grapnels, inflation. There seemed no end to these nor his curiosity, which for some masculine reason Arietti could not fathom, could only be satisfied by Pod. Any timid contribution on the part of Arietti seemed to slide across his mind unheard. And I know as much about it as anybody, she told herself crossly, as she huddled in the shadows. More, in fact, it was I who had to teach Papa. She stared in a bored way about the firelit room. The drawn curtains, plates glinting on the dresser, the general air of peace and comfort. Even this, in a way, they owed to her. It was she who had had the courage to speak to Miss Menzies, and in the course of this friendship, described their habits and needs. How smug they all looked in their ignorance as they sat around the fire. Leaning forward into the firelight, she said suddenly, Papa, would you listen, please? I don't see why not, replied Pod, smiling slightly at the eager, firelit face and the breathless tone of her voice. It's something I've got to tell you. I couldn't once, but I can now. As she spoke, her heart began to beat a little faster. Even Spiller was paying attention. It's about this house. It's about why they made these things for us. It's about how they knew what we wanted. What we wanted, repeated Pod. Yes, or why do you think they did it? Pod took his time. I wouldn't know for why they did it, he said at last any more than I'd know for why they built that church or the railway. Reckon they're furnishing all these houses, one by one, like. No, exclaimed Arietti, and her voice trembled slightly. You're wrong, Papa. They've only furnished this one house, and that's our house, because they know all about us, and they like us, and they want us to stay here. There was a short, stunned silence. Then Homily muttered, Oh, my goodness! under her breath. Spiller, still as stone, stared unblinkingly, and Pod said slowly, Explain what you mean, Arietti. How do they know about us? I told her, said Arietti. Her, repeated Pod slowly, rolling his R's in the country way, his custom when deeply moved. Miss Menzies, said Arietti, the tall one with the long hands who hid behind the thistle. Oh, my goodness, muttered Homily again. It's all right, mother, Arietti assured her earnestly. There's nothing to be frightened of. You'll be safe here, safer than you've ever been in the whole of all your life. They'll look after us and protect us and take care of us forever and ever and ever. She promised me. Homily, though trembling, looked slightly reassured. What does your father think? She asked faintly and stared across at Pod. Arietti, too, wheeled around toward him. Don't say anything, Papa. Not yet, please. Please. Not until I've told you everything. Then, at the sight of his expression, she lost her nerve and finished lamely. Then, you're practically sure to see. See what, said Pod. That it's quite all right. Go on, then, he said. Hurriedly, almost pleadingly, Arietti gave them the facts. She described her friendship with Miss Menzies right from the very beginning. She described Miss Menzies' character, her loyalty, her charity, her gifts, her imagination, and her courage. 
She even told him about dear Gladstone and about Aubrey, Miss Menzies' best friend. Homily shook her head there and clicked her tongue. Sad what happens, she said musingly. It was like when my younger sister, Milligram, Millie never married neither. She took to collecting dead flies' wings, making them into fans and such like. And pretty they looked in certain lights, all colors of the rainbow. And went on to describe all she had learned from Miss Menzies concerning Mr. Pot, how kind he was and how gentle and so skilled in making do and invention that he might be a borrower himself. That's right, Spiller said suddenly at this juncture. He spoke so freely that Arietti, looking across at him, felt something stir in her memory. Was he the borrower you once told us about? The one you said lived here alone? Spiller smiled slyly. That's right, he admitted. Learned a lot from him. Any borrower could. Not when everything's laid on, said Pod, and there's nothing left to borrow. Go on, Arietti, he said, as she suddenly seemed lost in thought. Well, that's all, at least all I can think of now. That's enough, said Pod. He stared across at her, his arms folded, his expression very grave. You shouldn't have done it, he said quietly, no matter what it's given us. Listen, Pod, Homily put in quickly. She's done it, and she can't undo it now, however much you scold her. I mean... She glanced about the firelit room at the winking plates on the dresser, the tap above the sink, the unlit globe in the ceiling. We've got a lot to be thankful for. It all smells of humans, said Pod. That'll wear off, Pod. Will it, he said. Arietti, suddenly out of patience, jumped up from her stool by the fire. I just don't know what any of you do want, she exclaimed unhappily. I thought you might be pleased or proud of me or something. Mother's always longed for a house like this. And fumbling at the latch, she opened the door and ran out into the moonlight. There was silence in the room after she'd gone. No one moved until a stool squeaked slightly as Spiller rose to his feet. Where are you off to? asked Pod casually. Just to take a look at my moorings. But you'll come back here to sleep, said Homily. Very hospitable, she felt suddenly, surrounded by newfound amenities. Thanks, said Spiller. I'll come with you, said Pod. No need, said Spiller. I'd like the air, said Pod. Arietti in the shadow of the house saw them go by in the moonlight. As they passed out of sight into darkness, she heard her father say, Depends how you look at it. Look at what, she wondered. Suddenly, Arietti felt left out of things. Her father and mother had their house. Spiller had his boat. Miss Menzies and Mr. Pott had his village. Mr. Pott had Miss Menzies and his railway. But what was left for her? She reached out and took hold of a dandelion stalk, which the size of a lamppost had grown beside the house to the height of her bedroom window. On a sudden impulse, she snapped the stalk in half. The silvery seeds scattered madly into the moonlight and the juice ran out on her hands. For a moment, she stood there watching all the silky spikes riding themselves had floated into darkness, and then suddenly, feeling cold, she turned and went inside. Homily sat where they had left her, dreaming by the fire. She had swept the hearth and lighted a dip which shed its glow from the table. Arietti, with a sudden pain, saw her mother's deep content. Would you like to live here always? She asked as she drew up a stool to the fire. Yes, said Homily. Now we've got it comfortable. Why, wouldn't you? I don't know, said Arietti. All those people in the summer, all the dust and noise. Yes, said Homily. You've got to keep on sweeping. But there's always something, she added. And at least we've got running water. And being cooped up during visiting hours. I don't mind that, said Homily. There's plenty to do in the house, and I've been cooped up all my life. That's your lot, like. Say you're born a borrower. Arietti was silent a moment. It would never be Spiller's lot, she said at last. Oh, him, exclaimed Homily impatiently. I've never known nothing about those out-of-doors ones. A race apart, my father used to say. Or house borrowers just gone wild. 
Where have they gone? They're all over the place, I shouldn't wonder, hidden away in the rabbit holes and hedges. I mean, my father and Spiller. Oh, them, down to the stream to see to his moorings. And if I was you, Arietti, Homley went on more earnestly, I'd get to bed before your father comes in. Your bed's all ready, new sheets and everything, and, her voice almost broke with pride, under the quilt, there's a little silken eider down. They're coming now, said Arietti. I can hear them. Well, just say good night and run off, urged Homily anxiously. As the latch clicked, she dropped her voice to a whisper. I think you've upset him a bit with this talk about Miss, Miss Menzies, said Arietti. And we'll go on with chapter 25 in the next video. Please like, subscribe if you haven't. For goodness sakes, how can you get this far in the book and not have subscribed? <laughs> Thanks so much for watching. I love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.